<laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Millennial Sales Podcast. This is episode 208. I'm your host, Tommy Tahoe Alemo. Uh, thank you for joining. This is where we help to break down how to have a successful sales career uh, as a young seller, uh, make more money, be more fulfilled, increase your skills, get promoted, uh, be able to sleep at night. I've had a few conversations with people that literally all we're trying to do right now is uh, not have stress dreams about deals and forecasts. Uh, so we're here for all of it. <laughs> Trust me, I've been there. Uh, I was there a couple nights ago. So it, it, it all comes and goes with the territory. Um, I want to talk about today's guest, um, Charles Mulbauer. Man, this was a good one. So Charles, there's really two main pillars uh, that I had Charles on the show and what we talked about. One is what he's really well known for nowadays. Uh, he's a senior business development training manager. So he's like, you know, the head sales coach pretty much at CB Insights, very cool company. And his whole premise right now is about discovery. He's obsessed with discovery, asking great questions, opening that up because um, for anyone that has been in sales and in a closing role, we know that discovery is really the foundation of sales, right? That allows you to um, you know, identify pain. It allows you to help solve a problem. You can use that through the rest of the sales cycle. Um, and you know, without a good problem, without good questions, you're not going to have good answers and you're not going to have anything to really uh, anchor you for a deal. So we do talk about the tactics that the second half of the show is very tactical. The first half is very inspirational. Uh, Charles was, uh, you know, really kind of like a late, uh, you know, quote unquote, late bloomer to get into sales. He was, um, an accountant for, uh, seven or eight years, I believe, um, and, you know, at, at some of the big firms, KPMG, Morgan Stanley, Deloitte, and um, he tells this amazing story about um, just kind of knowing in his heart that he wanted to get into sales, leaving his job with really no uh, prerequisite or no lineup to get into sales and just making it happen. And uh, I think it's just a really inspirational story. I know several people in my personal life, I bring a few of them up today um, that have gone from also accounting or teaching or uh, the restaurant business uh, into sales. And um, it's a great career. It can be fulfilling. It can be lucrative. Uh, and it can really bring you a lot of opportunity and joy. And, um, you know, Charles is a great example of, of being able to take that, that turn and then also really studying the craft of sales. So um, if you find up any value in the episode, head to Apple subscribe, leave a five-star review. You can hit me up uh, on all the social platforms. I'm at Tommy Tahoe, LinkedIn, Tom Alamo, uh, all that good stuff. Without further ado, I want to bring you my conversation. I'm delighted to bring you my conversation with Charles Mulbauer. Let's go. All right, Charles Mulbauer. Coming from New York, New York with the Krispy Kreme hat, head sales coach at CB Insights. How are we doing this morning? Doing, doing well. Doing well. I have my coffee in hand. Great to be here this morning. Do you have to, I've never seen anyone wear any sort of Krispy Kreme uh, hat, shirt, anything. Do you have to like get into some sort of a secret club or eat a certain <laughs> amount of donuts to receive that hat? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, my girlfriend got me this hat, so uh, I wish that was the case. I do have some time. A uh, you know, I'll do like a Krispy Kreme donut review, just for the okay. heck of it, um, because I love the donuts. But yeah, this is not even an advertisement. This is like a command. Mm. You know, eat Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm definitely a big fan. When you say you do a review, you mean you do it on like Instagram or Twitter or something? Yeah, or I do. I not. Yeah, I do it on Instagram uh, from time to time, uh, just like um, Dave Portnoy from Barstool yeah. Sports does the pizza reviews. I'll do a Krispy Kreme donut review. I yeah, love so it. The, yeah. So the first review I did, I was like, you know, on a, we'll see what this what this is on a scale of one to ten, and I gave it a twelve. So wow, you know, that's that's how good. <laughs> you're you're an easier judge than he is. He, he yeah, places right. apart. Yeah, he's very tough. Very tough. Very, very tough. But he's good. 
He's very good. Now, just just on, on that topic, being a New York guy, he, he is a believer, as well as I, that the real capital of pizza in the United States is New Haven, Connecticut, not New York City. How do you take that statement? Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, first of all, I was not aware of that. Um, how do I take that statement? I'm surprised. Okay. I'm very surprised. Yeah. But I'm sure, I mean, how much, uh, uh, if it's better, I, I can't imagine it's uh, significantly better. It's probably a little better, you know, because yeah. New, York's, New York's pretty darn good. Yeah, I mean, New York's great. Being from the East Coast and now on the West Coast, I mean, the pizza and bagel industry out here is is just not good at all. Yeah, it's weak. So, it's yeah, weak. it's weak. It's weak. That's like <laughs> half, the, half the reason I go back East is to see family. The other half is to get just carbo load on all of that good stuff. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm sure New Haven's great, but I'm I'm definitely uh, don't feel like I'm missing anything. I guess okay, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, I want to get into uh, the conversation today. There's a few things I want to touch on. The first is you just have an interesting background that I want to dig into, right? Um, you don't have uh, the background that a lot of folks maybe come into this podcast with that they went to school and then straight out of school maybe they tried sales, they went to some startup and started doing that. You spent a number of years uh, in consulting and in financial markets at Deloitte and KPMG and Morgan Stanley. So uh, could you walk me through that a little bit about your experience at some of those really large institutions and then how you, I don't know if you're doing any level of sales there or if it was more like, um, you know, analyst work, but but how that kind of transitioned to a sales uh, context for you? Yeah, sure. So uh, it, it definitely wasn't a uh, a normal transition. I wouldn't consider it a transition at all. It was more of like a jump. Yeah. Um, but I would say that during my time there, I was definitely in a in an analyst position. I was a CPA, and so it took me you know a very long time to kind of figure out. What I wanted to do, I wasn't doing any sales during this time. I think the when I was at Deloitte, the first time I started realizing that sales might be something that's for me, uh, I actually started introducing the partners to people that I had met outside of work that were running hedge funds. Um, and I decided to connect them because the team that I was working for at Deloitte was auditing hedge funds. So I figured, hey, the partners might be interested in meeting hedge funds that we don't you know, audit or don't work for. Um, and so I started making those introductions for them voluntarily, voluntarily outside of my own you know, day-to-day -day job. And then they started inviting me to the breakfasts uh, that they would have with these potential prospects. Of course, I, I didn't really say much, but, you know, I made the introduction, so they brought me there, and I liked, at the time, you know, connecting with, uh, you know, making those introductions and really just connecting people at that time. Um, and then I realized that, you know, the way I think about a career is I kind of split it out into, if you think about what you want to do with your career, you either fit into one of three buckets is kind of how I figured it out. Uh, bucket number one is you know, if you have a picture of it, looks like a, a spreadsheet. So if you love spreadsheets and analytics, data, you wanna spend all your time there, that's like bucket number one. Bucket number two, the picture looks like, you know, either shaking hands with someone or picking up the phone, right? That's what I kind of picture as bucket number two. And then bucket number three is both. You're just great at both. Right. What's what do you feel like you're great at? You're great at one, two, or three. So until it took me some time to figure out like how to split out those three areas, uh, I realized I was definitely not bucket number one. Um, and since bucket number one is involved or part of bucket number three, that by process of elimination got rid of that one. And so I was left with bucket number two. And I was like, you know, that's that's what speaks to me. I don't know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what speaks to me. Um, and so the long story short uh, is I had an evaluation meeting with a, a partner of mine at Deloitte. This is in like, I was a, a CPA for 10 years, right? At Morgan Stan at KPMG, Morgan Stanley at Deloitte. 
finally, one of my evaluation meetings at Deloitte, uh, the partner uh, of my team, whose name was Martin, you know, sat me down and said, you know, so Charles, you know, how are you happy here? And I kind of knew what he was getting at. You don't ask somebody, are you happy here if you don't think they're not so happy here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so he asked me, are you happy here? And I said, well, and I, when he asked me that, um, I was uh, 31 years old, right? So we're talking about 10 years of being a CPA and never made a sale, never made a cold call, nothing like that. He said, are you happy here? And I two like two voices in my head, Voice number one was Charles, just like tell him what he wants to hear so you can keep your job, yeah. be safe and do what you got to do. The other voice was like, Charles, is this really going to be your life? Is You want to you wanna stay this way or you just want to tell him the truth and while, while knowing that you're probably not going to be here soon after you tell him, but just tell him what you want. So... He said, are you happy here? And I said, Martin, are we having an, an open conversation? And he said, absolutely, we are. I said, okay, well, uh, I don't think this job is for me and I wanna be in sales. That's all I said. And this is a partner at Deloitte, right? He's been there for like 20 years, right? Yeah. Very serious, aud you know, audits hedge funds is a very, um, You know, the, the job is high risk because if he makes a, a mistake in an audit, you know, he's, he's a very serious guy. That's all my thing. I want to be in sales. Huge smile across his face. And I said, why are you smiling? And he said, I think you'd be great at sales. <laughs> <laughs> and this like, I was totally relieved. Then I said, thank you. And then he's like, why don't you be a financial advisor? Why don't you do this? Right? He starts giving me ideas on what to sell. At the end of the conversation, he said, Charles, I can't promise. Said, he said, Charles, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and help you get a sales job at Deloitte. But if I can't, um, whatever job you look to have next, you make sure that they call me because you worked your butt off for me and my team and you make sure they call me as a reference. Hmm. Said, great, thank you. Now Deloitte, they give you mentors, right? So after your meeting, you go to your mentor and they're like, oh, tell me how the meeting went. So I go to my mentor and she's like, oh, how'd the meeting go? I was like, oh, I told him I didn't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. Um, so two months later, you know, I left. And then, uh, sorry if the story is too long, Tom. No, no, keep it going. Uh, okay. <laughs> I asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and so the next day, a good friend of mine, I called a good friend of mine, and he uh, he said, what are, you, you know, what are you up to? I said, I just left Deloitte. He's like, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, well, nothing right now. He said, well, why don't you come with me to uh, New York Tech Day? Um, have you heard of New York Tech Day, Tom? No. So New York Tech Day, I, at the time I didn't know, is this startup networking event at J the Jacob Javits Center. I'm like, okay, I'll go. So I went, 31 years old, probably like, uh, it's like this, this largest startup networking event, supposedly, uh, either in the United States or the world. Hmm. And once a year, I went there, was blown away. I, it's like I entered into like a new galaxy because I was in the corporate world for 10 years. I didn't know anything else. And right? this is yeah. this is like 2013 also. So things, you know, the startup mentality wasn't like as prevalent. It wasn't right. um people weren't talking about it as much as they are now. So I went and maybe there are 2500 3000 people there, you know, people anywhere from 25 to 30 years old standing behind their booths, you know, that they run a company. I was like, what's this wild, right? Yeah. So I go home and they, they give out these books telling you, you know, giving you a sense of all the companies that were there. I go home. I was, I was really most interested in fintech. And I go open up my laptop and I, I, look, I look up the fintech section. I look up all the companies and I, I found one uh, called Axial, uh, which is a, a startup that 
well, it's not a startup anymore, but it's a company that uh, connects, you know, private equity firms with intermediaries and CEOs so they can connect and maybe do business together and transact for private equity firms and other companies that buy companies to find companies to buy. That's what they yeah. do. I looked them up and uh, at the time, uh, Sam Jacobs, who runs Revenue Collective, was the head of sales there. Didn't know who he was. Um, looked him up, sent him an email. Hey, Sam, you don't know me. I was at New York Tech Day. I think what you guys are doing is really cool. I was most recently at Deloitte, and I'd like to be in sales. Here's my resume. He connected me with the head of HR. I had, I don't know, three rounds of interviews there. Um, that's a whole story in and of itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and uh, they, before they made the offer, they said, do you have a reference? And who is my reference? Martin, the partner at Deloitte. And he's like, you got you to gotta hire this guy. So they hired me as in 2013 as an account executive. We didn't have SDRs. That wasn't like a thing. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a, a common, I think at the time, you know, predictable revenue may have just come out. I don't remember when it came out, but we had one individual at the company who was just, you know, setting up meetings for 12 AEs, but each AE was responsible for everything. Right. And this was my first sales job. Um, and I went from making, you know, like $100,000 a year where I went to Axial and they're like, you know, do you know how much? We pay for this job. I said no. I said well, it's fifty thousand dollars. Are you okay with that? I'm like I don't really care to be honest with you. Mm. I'm, mm. I'm 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 ready. Yeah. Um, You're already so, too far in at this point. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't quit the job, go for the interview, and then be oh. That's all it is? Yeah, you know, exactly, no right? Exactly. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> I was just, I'm, 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 I'm in it. Like, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, and actually, when the CEO of Axial interviewed me, his name is Peter Lerman, you know, when, I, when he stepped in the room, he, he picked up my resume and he said, I don't understand why you're here. You're a CPA. You've never sold anything before. What, what what am I missing? And I said to him something along the lines of, because I knew that I really had to convince him that I want this, right? Because it's weird. It looks weird. So I said to him, you know, Peter, it took me a long time to realize what I want to do. And I said, most people in life don't ever realize what they want to do. And for those people that do realize what they want to do, most of those people don't have the wherewithal to do it. Mm. I said, I realized I, what I want to do. I said, if you look at my resume, I can get an accounting job tomorrow. I don't need to be here. I can get an accounting job. I, that's not what I want. And I pitched him on the reason why I felt I could contribute to the growth of the company. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my speech, he started smiling. I realized the smile, right, from the partner at Deloitte, from the CEO, yeah. it was a good sign. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then I started, and then you know, there's, there's more story after that. But that's that's really how I made the transition. The transition. It's not even a transition. I was just like, I hate what I do. I want to do this, and I had to show them. I had to show them that why, how I was ready. Right? They asked me. You know, you can't just come here and say that you want to do sales. Like, show me that you're doing what, – what are you doing on your own to yeah. get there? Um, and that's how I started my sales career in, 20, uh, in 2013. I love that story, and it's, it's really pertinent because I have a good friend that was in accounting for um, maybe not 10 years, but probably six, seven years, and just switched uh, and got his first SDR job last month. And I was talking to him uh, last week, and he was having a tough time. They gave him this pretty boring script uh, that he's supposed to read off of for his cold calls. And you know, mind you, he's very personable. He's hilarious. He's you know very extroverted. And so my advice to him was was to get more creative off of that script and be yourself and and try to be a little bit looser on the phone. So I'm curious for the folks that maybe have done a job 
that was in that first bucket, you know, bucket number one, that was more analytical, or maybe that that's how they grew up. They were really into math and science and things like that. And now find themselves in sales. Like what was a, what was the toughest transition for you from those two jobs? That's an awesome question, by the way, super cool. I don't know who you, this is your friend you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, super cool that your friend did that. I give your friend a lot of credit. So shout out to Tanner. Tanner. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Keep it going, Tanner. Very, very cool. A lot of respect. Um, for me, when I was in sales, right at the age of 31, so a couple of things. First of all, for, for those that don't know, even if you know you want to be in sales, what I also realized when I was an auditor at Deloitte was I had this feeling in my gut, you know, because you're with other people on the team, other associates, other analysts, or what have you. And I said to myself, there's no way I'm ever going to be better than this guy or than this girl. Yeah. They're just better than me. And I said that about pretty much all of them. <laughs> when I went into sales and when I sat down, you know, at my desk and I met all the sales guys, very personable, very cool, right? Very friendly. I said to myself, I haven't, I haven't sold anything before, but I don't know why the person, I can't be just as good as the person next to me. I don't see hmm. why. And I had that feeling and that realization gave me the confidence to like work my butt off. Now, mm -hmm. the first six months of the role, I couldn't sell. Yeah. Uh, similar to your friend Tanner, uh, in, not that he can't sell, but similar to your friend Tanner in terms of I was stuck in an analytical mindset yeah. and I was afraid to be myself. And so I thought there was a formula, like a real formula, just like in audit, there's a formula or, I mean, there's, there's some creativity there, but not, not clearly not a lot. And I started really kind of asking my colleagues, you know, what questions should I be asking? What question should I ask? And I would just copy what they were doing. So what happened to me was I was just saying what I was told to say on the phone and asking the questions I was told to ask on the phone. Yep. And no one really told me or taught me how to actually listen. Uh, it sounds weird, um, but back then I was a really poor listener. Very poor. I was just trying, you know, I was used to saying to myself, just get the job done and, and move forward. And it was, I was all concentrated on me. So uh, for six months, I had trouble selling. Uh, I mentioned the story on uh, to a couple of, uh, a couple of folks recently where I was trying to sell a, a head of a, um, a venture capital firm, right? In biotech. And I was asking him a number of questions. And in the middle of the conversation, I swear this happened to me. This is when I was like at rock bottom. Like I it was like month six, haven't sold anything yet. Very weird. And in the conversation, the founder of the firm said, Charles, Charles, Charles. I said, yeah. He goes, you're in sales, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, that's interesting because you're not listening to a word I'm telling you. He said that to me. And it kind of woke, it really woke me up. It yeah. woke me up. And I went home that night and I was like, I haven't sold anything for six months. The only reason why the company gave me a long runway was because they saw how hard I was working, right? Uh, there were other people I started with that were, you know, that, that were fired, but they weren't doing any better than I was but they saw that I was like working really, really hard, staying late, all that stuff. Uh, then I went home that night and I said, you know what? I can't get any worse, right? The only way I'm gonna get better is if I stop caring about what I'm looking to accomplish on the phone, start being myself if I wanna make a silly joke, I'm going to make a silly joke. If I want to talk about, I sing professionally outside of work at weddings and stuff. If I want to talk about my singing career, I'm going to talk about my singing career. If I want to ask them a weird question about what they do outside of work, I'm going to ask them. 
that I was like, you know, I can't lose. It's a, it's impossible for me to get any worse. Why don't I just be myself? It's maybe it sounds a little cheesy. That was yep. the epiphany. I went to work. I had all my, you know, questions on my desk and stuff. I was like, I threw it out. And as soon as I hopped on the phone with somebody, Hey John, it's, it's Charles. Glad we could connect. By the way, before we even start talking, I, I, I see that you're from San Francisco. I actually just sang at a wedding there a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago. And he's like, really, you sing at weddings? I was like, yeah, that's what I do. What, do you do anything crazy outside of work? And I started being myself and I was so, it allowed me, Tom, to be more comfortable, to be more present. And the most important thing it allowed me to do is st- I stopped caring. <laughs> Yeah, I stopped caring so much about where the call was going to go or the outcome of the call. You know, you're, you hear of a lot of yeah. people on LinkedIn, you know, stop caring about the outcome. I, I figured that out just from giving up almost, yeah. right? And the sales, they just they skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. It was the most unbelievable. And if I wanted to ask a weird question, I'd say, you know, Bob, I, I'm not sure how to ask this, but is it okay if I ask you a really direct question? But it was I was myself. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And my my personality came through. The laughter came through. The resistance was gone because I also like indirectly communicated to them. Like, I don't care if you don't work with us. You know, we would love to work with you, but I'm not going to kill myself over it if you don't want to work with us. And all that came through the phone and just it took off. And that was that's what happened to me. So part of the things that I We'll probably get to this later. You know, I, I, I'm a uh, I'm a coach at CB Insights, so you know I do, in terms of a mindset, coach people on like just to don't don't be so hard on yourself, don't be so hard on people, be yourself. The scripts, right? The scripts are you know the, they're just frameworks, really. You got to make a, everything. You got to make your own, right? You're like a chef. Yeah. Okay, these are the these are the ingredients. Uh, or these are these are the um, but we're not, these are these are the ingredients, but we're not going to give you the measurements, right? right. That's that's kind of how how I think about it. So that's what happened to me. I love that. I love that story, and um, I do want to get into to some of the stuff with CB Insights. But I have to ask: you're the first person I think that I've met, definitely that I've interviewed, that worked for Sam Jacobs, who's who's really just a legend. I love. Revenue Collective, and and uh, he he obviously has a very powerful network. What was it like to work for him? Sam Jacobs, um, what what he did, what was great about Sam Jacobs is you wanted to do well for him. That's yeah. that was like the if I were to boil it down to one thing, you as an account executive, yeah, you wanted to make money, you wanted to do well, but when you worked for him. You just wanted to do well for him. It was like, it was kind of like, um, <laughs> maybe not the best way to explain it, but you know, as a leader, you just want you want him to lead, to be successful. Also, yeah, that's what he does. He's like, it's not. It was the the way he, the way it came across was it's it's not just it's not about me. We're in, we're in this together, and I want to help you. And I want to do everything I can to help you. And if you have a problem, I'm going to be there to help you because I want you, all of you to do so well. Mm. And we're like, wow, I got to, I mean, I got to do well for this guy. And that's, yeah. you kind of like, you kind of like wanted to fall on your sword almost for him. Like when you're going to battle, right? Yeah. Not that I've ever gone to battle <laughs> uh, outside <laughs> sales of sales. Battles. <laughs> yeah. Sales battles. You have like, you know, a general or what have you. You wanna do general, like that. That's kind of what what the mindset was, and that's what allowed us to be a really successful sales team. Yeah, I found that the people that I've worked for that you knew were all the way in, right? On you, on the company, on the goals, on the mission. Those are the people, at least for me, that I worked wanted to work the hardest for. Uh, the people that. They seem kind of half-assed. Maybe half-assed in the job might be a little bit too far of a critique, but they were kind of on the boat, kind of off the boat. They weren't giving it everything. You felt like you were working a lot harder than they were. Uh, yeah, I've had leaders where it's like, 
man, I work hard. I work long. I don't work as hard as that guy. It's just like, man, I, I want to, I'm giving it all for, for, for him or her. So um, I can, I can definitely relate to that. Exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's get into what you're doing right now at CB. Uh, and, you know, I, I know a lot of your focus in coaching is really around discovery. Um, and so I'd love to first maybe set the stage on why that is. Mm -hmm. um, I have some, I have some uh, hypotheses, but I'd love to hear you talk about maybe set the stage. What's the issue with discovery right now with AEs? Like, why is that something that we need to focus on? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it, it, it's really simple. Um, and just to relate it to what I went through, I, I only, I realized how important it was because I, I, I wasn't doing it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, at the time when I was started in sales, I was taught like discovery is the most important thing. But at the time it didn't resonate with me because I was like, how is discovery the most important thing? Isn't the product the most important thing? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like people want to see what we do. It didn't, it didn't resonate. Um, and so it only resonated once I had to change how I sold, right? So in terms of that, that's kind of how I realized why, why it's so important. Um, I already forgot the question, Tom. <laughs> yeah, no, that was it. That was it. That was, uh, I already forgot the question. Right <laughs> yeah it's so your first day back on from the three day week. yeah <laughs> cut everyone cut everyone some slack today um so yeah i so i know that that probably ties directly back to your situation where that person the hedge fund manager is like hey you're not listening probably you know ties back to that you weren't probably asking a lot of questions or asking a lot of good questions um so what's the let's just pretend i'm an ae i'm coming to work for you and uh, maybe I just got promoted from SDR to AE. I'm fresh. I don't have any bad habits here. Um, what What's the initial lesson that you want to teach to me about discovery? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's two things, two main things, two main okay. things. Um, one big thing is to learn how to ask your first problem question. It's actually a very big thing because um, let's say you're having a conversation with a prospect, you know, tell me a little bit how you guys you know, do X, Y, and Z. Um, and, you know, how you go about, what, what is your, pro how you getting the job done today, stuff like that. After that conversation, tell me a little bit about your team and what you guys do and how you guys get done X, Y, and, how you get X, Y, and Z done today, whatever. Then it's time for the problem question. Um, I find that, and I still find, very few AEs um, know how to execute that problem question well. Um, so that's the first thing I teach. Let me be a bit more specific. What they think, what they try to initially do is try to uncover problems. Maybe, maybe they'll ask, do you ever have a problem with this? To what extent do you have a problem with that? You know, when you're, you know, researching and, you know, with CB Insights, when you're finding, um, you know, do, doing research on, on startups, do you ever find that you miss out on a company? Stuff like that. They try to uncover problems. Um, so that's like a, a common denominator weakness. Once they understand how to really ask that first problem question, it really helps them start the conversation really, really effectively. The way I coach them to do that is like a, it's like a, a four-step mini roadmap. Um, it's give context, give insight, um, to what extent, if not what does. That's the roadmap. So it's like giving context. It's, hey, Tom, thanks for sharing all that with me, just to give you some context about, about us. You know, as you can imagine, we speak to probably, I speak to maybe three or four XYZ teams pretty much on a daily basis. As you can imagine, they tell me a lot of different things that they either want to be better better at or maybe they're frustrated with. Um, that's to give you context. Uh, next step to give you insight. So to give you some insight, they tell me that they want to be better at this, they're frustrated with that, they're worried about this, or 
they are concerned about that. Uh, that's step two. Step three, to what extent? I, I don't know to what extent any of that resonates with you at all. Um, and then the last step, um, and if not, you know, what do you think might come to mind? So that's like I teach them how to execute that question. Um, so instead of uncovering problems, you're actually raising issues. Yeah, but it's like me telling you, like I I'm in the game. Right, we're on the same level. This is what I hear all day long. If you ever read question-based selling, it's the difference between being the message and the messenger. Right, mm -hmm. when you're a salesperson, you don't want to be the message. You don't want to be the the guy who's got all the ideas. You want to be the messenger. Like it, I'm just a middleman. Right? This is what I hear all day. I teach that. The second thing I teach is to um, how, how to actually listen for triggers. So there are um, pretty much uh, four main listening triggers that I teach where when a prospect says something like this, it's a trigger for you to say, let me stay here, right? Let me stay here and ask about that for a second, or let me pause and stay there. How they stay there, what questions to ask is a separate thing, but like listening triggers because nobody taught me like what to really listen for. And nobody taught me that when I hear something specific to like slow down, right? So I teach them more about how to how to listen and what to listen for. And then once those, last, those items are shared by the prospect, you can start building some sort of tree if you're taking notes like, oh, they said, that they might have a problem with A. I'm gonna ask about that. And then they start building like a tree. A rolls into B, rolls into C, and they have some really like deep discovery. So those are the two main things I teach outside of all the technicalities. Yeah. And I've seen um, some differing opinions recently on the LinkedIn, you know, feeds on the how good impact questions are, right? Um, I've heard uh -huh. some people you know, who teach it say, hey, if you're not asking the impact question, you're leaving money on the table, you're not getting deep enough into pain. I know this is uh -huh. probably very tactical. I've also seen other folks post like, well, that just sounds very awkward and mechanical, you know, right. asking someone, well, what is this going to cost you? And like, it's like, you know, the person on the other side of the phone is like, well, I, I know where this is going. You know, you're just trying to set me up to spend, you know, right. $1,000 on your tool. So where do you stand on impact questions uh, and how do you teach on that? That's a, first of all, you make a really, really good point. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I also kind of posted something like that a while ago on, on impact questions. I find personally, I find impact questions to be a really weird question. Yeah. It's just weird. Um, you know, when prospects are being asked questions, they always want to know why you're asking something. If you ask a question and they don't understand why you're asking it, that by definition equals an interrogation. Hmm. Um, so, you know, prospects crave reasons. Um, I learned that a long time ago from John Barrows in 2013. Um, and people crave reasons. Like, why are you asking me that question? And when you get up, when you're at a point where you're asking a question, the prospects like, why are you asking me that? That's not a good place to be. And the impact question can get you there if it's done wrong. Um, so uh, the way I approach that is one of two ways. Um, I'm a big fan of, of humbling disclaimers. Tom, have you ever heard of humbling disclaimers? Um, I could probably make it up, but no, I haven't okay. heard that okay. before. Yeah, so humbling disclaimers kind of changed my life. Uh, it's okay. from question-based from, from question selling. A humbling disclaimer is when I'm about to ask you a weird question, I give you a disclaimer uh, of what I'm about to do. So a humbling disclaimer might sound like, Tom, I, I feel a little awkward asking this question. I recognize it might not come across the best way, but I was wondering. Or Tom, I, I, this, this question might sound a little weird or direct, so I apologize, but I was wondering, right? Or Tom, for, forgive me for asking this question. Uh, it might be a little bit out of bounds, was curious, right? So I'm preparing you, the prospects for a direct question. 
Um, and when you use a humbling disclaimer, it allows you to feel comfortable asking the next question, transferring your insecurity over to the prospect, giving the prospect a chance to want to save you almost and say, Tom, like, don't worry about it. Right. Yep. So if I were to ask you an impact question, um, I might say, cool. So Tom, I, uh, again, this is version one, Tom, I, I don't really know how to ask this question. It might come across uh, not the right way, so please forgive me. But when you think about the any potential impact it might have for you guys not to have this information, uh, I'm curious, you know, what comes to mind, if anything at all. I know again that might sound like a weird question, but I don't really know how to ask it. Curious what what your thoughts are. Right, so I'm giving like a disclaimer at the beginning and at the end, kind of like yeah. a sandwich, like I'm sandwiching yeah. it, so that it comes across really, really thoughtful, um, and they'll be mo more open to answering it. That's version one, okay? okay? Version two is to kind of do the same thing with the problem question. Like you're raising the issues that you hear. So same thing with the impact question, like, hey, Tom, I don't know if any of this is going to resonate with you at all, but I created kind of like a list of impacts that other teams have found this either has had on their team or could have. I wrote them down. Um, here they are on a slide if I'm sharing my screen. Do any of these resonate with you at all or I'm like like totally way off base? Mm. Right? So I'm also I'm also telling you what I hear, but that it's not necessarily going to resonate with you. So right. those are two different ways to do it as opposed to just asking the question. So I'm very into if you're going to ask a, a weird question or a direct question or a question that's going to might not come across well, you want to cushion it with either humbling disclaimers and or what you hear. I hear this when you're whenever you're it's funny, whenever you're teaching a prospect something about what you hear, they respect you more. Yeah. Um, and so they also feel like, you know, Tom knows, knows what he's talking about. Like, yeah, those, those resonate and I'm not alone. Right. We've all heard that. Um, and those are better ways to ask an impact question. Um, you can even, I guess a version three, now that we're thinking about it, you know, Tom, I, I, I'm not sure how to ask this, but has the, has the team ever kind of like sat back and asked themselves like what the impact is for the team, if anything at all, um, if you weren't have, you know, not, if you weren't able to have this information, I know that may sound like a weird question. So I'm not sure really how to ask it. Mm. Right. So it's more about, uh, I think the delivery of it is more important and the vulnerability of like, I'm not even really sure what I'm asking. Yeah. Kind of thing. So the prospect's like, no, I, I get what you're asking. I, I'll help you. I'll help you answer that. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of yeah. I mean, even your example earlier of, uh, hey, do you, do you mind if I ask you a direct question? Because then it's like you're kind of setting the table that this is going to be a direct question. And they probably yeah. said, yeah, you can, you know, like kind of almost cushioning if you're going to ask that type of a question. So it doesn't sound too aggressive or too corny or too anything. Um, exactly. And I also, Tom, I'm going to slip in one more, if you don't mind, hit me. Uh, a, like a version four, if you will, is like, you can even say, Hey, Tom, you know, besides the obvious concerns or impacts of like a and B, like if you're in sales, now you're an AE, let's say I'm trying to sell you something. I'm not going to say, Hey, Tom, what's the impact to your job? If you don't hit quota. You'd be like, why are you at, why are you asking me such a dumb question? Like I get fired. <laughs> I don't right, make money. right, right, right. That that's the danger of the impact. Like, don't ask me. Don't be thoughtless about the impact question. Right. So that's a thoughtless way to ask it. A yeah. thoughtful way to ask it is is to say besides the obvious, right? Yeah. But Tom, you know, as a salesperson, besides you know the obvious impacts of maybe getting fired or um, uh, you know, the, maybe the morale isn't great. What, what, what other, what, what, what are the things you might be concerned about if you're not able to hit your quota? I know that sound might sound like a weird question, but does anything come to mind? You see, it's a more thoughtful way to ask. Like I say, besides the obvious impacts of A and B, 
Uh, maybe that wasn't perfect. Maybe maybe I could have asked that better, but it's the formula that I'm caring about besides the obvious ones because yeah. you know, I'm, not, I'm not thoughtless. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Yeah. Right? So I'm kind of beating you to the punch there. Now, how about, um, you know, I like to think of discovery as a constant process, right, throughout the right. sales cycle, right, which I'm, I am sure that you would probably agree with to at least some extent that you don't get, it's not just like 15 minutes on the first call and then the rest is just you doing your thing, right? Like right. throughout the sales process, you want to continue the discovery. Um, so I guess my question is, if I'm an AE and I'm prepping for a call, right, um, would you suggest that? I spend some time like writing out one to three questions that I want to get answered, regardless of where we are in the sales cycle um, and what that goal is, or how do you, how do you teach folks to, to prep and, and, and continue to do the discovery throughout the process and make sure have things changed? Are there pieces that we haven't uncovered? Uh, we didn't get to everything on the first call. So now we need to get into some things in the next you know, few. Uh, how do you coach folks to prepare and, and continue that process? How do I coach folks to prepare? Um, well, I think like as a as a first, like if I'm an AE and I'm having my first conversation with a prospect, um, I definitely have at least three questions I want to ask at like a minimum of three. I kind of ask, I ask AEs, you know, just tell me what are the absolute questions you have to ask in a first call. The basic ones, can you tell me what you do? How do you do it? And then the problem question, okay? So it's at least the minimum, the bare minimum of three. Once uh, a prospect, you know, if you, once you bring up the problem question, that's where um, hopefully the conversation will take a nice turn. If a problem resonates, now we have something to talk about, okay? Mm -hmm. now let's talk about if a problem doesn't resonate. A second, <laughs> right? Because um, everybody wants to. Know. I find a lot of people ask about the minority, not the minority of situations, but um, you know the extreme situations. What if this happens? What if that happens? They want to know about yeah. that first. Um, yeah, Charles. Um, no, those 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 problems really don't don't kind of resonate with us. Um, you know, we're doing pretty pretty well. Then I might then at that at that time I'd be like, cool. So. Um, Listen, we that's that's kind of what where we specialize. Um, it, it sounds like you guys are are really you have all that covered. Um, is there anything else you think that's worth discussing that you think we might be able to help you with? Because I'm getting the sense that's probably probably not a, a a real fit to to help you if those aren't really things that are are top of mind for you. So at that time, I kind of want to disqualify them a little bit. Yep. Right. Where like, okay, we we don't. Sounds like we shouldn't talk anymore. <laughs> really, <laughs> is kind of where I want to go with that. A lot of times, conversations there turn around. Well, they say not really, and then they then they talk about something that we could possibly help with. And now, because they voluntarily told me what we might be able to help them with, now I can dig into that a little bit. Right. Right. You might argue, well, Charles, if the main problems you help with is not something that they feel they have a problem with, then you should just hang up the phone. Um, I disagree. I think it's good to have the conversation going because once they tell you about something else that maybe you can help out with, a lot of times runs back into one of the problems that you mentioned earlier right. that they didn't really connect with. Um, so that's kind of, uh, again, uh, scene one. Scene two, if they say, yeah, those, those problems uh, resonate, um, especially, you know, this one that you mentioned. I say, cool. Um, now, now I'm in a converse. Now I'm in a real conversation. Before I want to, ideally, ideally, before I get into my demo, I recognize it's not black and white, right? So, I'll say that that that's really interesting. Um, out of curiosity, before Tom, you ever like spoke to someone like me. Um, to what extent have you ever done anything about that problem? Or would you say it hasn't been a big enough problem to do anything about? It's just something that bothers you, but not that much, right? It's kind of like disqualifying you again, but in a different way. I want to test, I kind of want to test you now. So 
you might say, that obviously the conversation can go in a variety of different ways. But at the end of the conversation, you're gonna say, listen, you know, you mentioned a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you feel like those are issues you, you feel like it's worth investing in just to, to help, because that's where we specialize, but you know, do you think it's a terrible idea for us to show you how we might be able to help you? And it's like, uh, I, you learn in question-based selling. I keep talking about that book. So Shout I Shout out apologize. Tom Freeze. Tom Freeze, right. Uh, he talks about how, you know, our goal is not to get the prospect to drink. Our goal is to make them first, make them thirsty. Yep. Right? So that's a lot of disqualification. So it's just the first conversation. But once you're on the demo, right, the beginning of the demo is cool. Tom, you know, I, I thought a lot about our, our last call. Uh, and I know it's been a couple of weeks back. I, I wrote a custom notes and I wrote them down on the slide. These are the things that we talked about. And these are the things that are really most interesting to you. Is there anything that, that I, I kind of wrote down here that that's wrong? No, you, you got to correct. Cool. Has anything changed since we last spoke? Like, have you thought about anything else that maybe we didn't talk about they think we should talk about today? Yes or no? Cool. And by the way, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to start the demo. Is it right if I maybe um, ask two or three more questions about some of the things that we talked about? Yeah. That's now, then, then we start the demo. And then during the demo, it's, you know, it depends on they react to things, right? Yeah. But during the demo, I'm going to say, you know, you know, we talked about last time, you told me this is something that important, you know, how does fixing that with this part of what we do, you know, how, how do you think that might help you? What are your thoughts there? How do you think that would you, you'd use it? Where do you think that might help you, if at all? So the rest of the demo is just me asking you, how do you feel? How are you doing this now? How does this compare to how you're doing it now? Do you think it's worth talking more or is this not even helpful at all? I'm kind of getting you to just sell yourself. Mm -hmm. It's really my goal. So the, yeah, you're right, Tom. The discovery is the entire time. Um, and the way I think about discovery is to, it's all incremental. Like you, it's all, it's all about, do you think it's worth talking more or no? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what I'm asking you every step of the way. You think yeah. it's worth talking more or not really? Yeah. I'm like teasing you. Yeah. Um, and then Kevin Dorsey, who really created an amazing, amazing training on uh, Udemy, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I bought it for like 12, 13 bucks. Mm -hmm. He talks about how before you know you talk about pricing, you might even say something like, hey, so Tom, like b before we even talk about pricing, like to what extent do you believe we can even really help you at this point? Because if you don't even believe that, we don't have to talk about pricing or next steps. It's totally okay. Are you always <laughs> like kind of pushing them away a yeah. little bit? Push, pull, push, pull. Um, so that's how I think about this, this discovery process the entire time. It's a push-pull process the entire time. And you want to do a little bit more pushing yeah. than you do pulling is the way yeah. I would think about it. I love it. I love it. Well, I know we're, we're, we've got our backs against the wall here on time. Um, so my last question for you, and, and then we'll uh, let people I'm, know. I'm not used to time. talking this much, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, it's been great, man. It's been great. My, my last question for you, um, before we can tell people where, to find you and, and hit you up. Uh, you mentioned question-based selling a few times. Any other books or resources um, that you're either taking in right now or that have been impactful for you? And, and it could be about this topic or, or otherwise, uh, but anything that comes to mind? Yeah, sure. I thought uh, Sales Differentiation was a great, great book. Um, there are a lot of good parts in there on, on how to ask specific types of questions. Um, I liked this transparency sale as well. I thought that was really, really helpful. I got a couple of very good nuggets out of there. Um, I haven't found a, a book that really compares to the effectiveness of the question-based selling book, to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, granted, I haven't read every, uh, every sales book on the planet, but it, it's rare for me to learn something significantly new uh, yeah. after reading that book. But I do get some good nuggets from, from those books. Um, by the way, if, if you're, if anybody's listening is like brand new to sales, that's just a fantastic, fantastic book to read that would really, really helpful, be really helpful for you. But I definitely am always on the lookout for different ways of doing things. That's great. That's great. And uh, what's the best place for folks if they want to 
talk shop, talk about discovery. If we have any uh, accountants that are, uh, you know, <laughs> thinking about dipping their toe into sales or uh, interested in CB insights or any of the above, uh, what's the best place for folks to connect with you? Yeah, sure. I mean, clearly you're all welcome to hit me up on LinkedIn, Charles Mulbauer, M-U-H-L-B-A-U-E-R. That's really the best way. Send me uh, a, a, a note or even leave me a voice note. I'm a big fan of voice notes and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to connect. That's awesome. Well, Charles, I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you spending your time this morning. I know you're a little under the weather. I hope I'm not holding you from any uh, Krispy Kreme uh, donut <laughs> reviews for lunch or anything like that, but uh, I had a blast. It was great chatting with you. Tom, this really was awesome. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Happy March. Thank you for listening to that episode while you're walking the dog or doing your laundry or prospecting, whatever you're up to. Uh, please head over to Apple, leave a review, five-star review. Helps me grow the show. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, Tom Malamo, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Tom McTahoe. Peace.